Chapters 17 and 18 of The Cross Brand by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 17. When the two fugitives sprang out into the night from the rear door of the jail, it was like leaping into the danger of an unawakened hive of bees. For the shouts from the jail had not raised a mere scattering of voices from the village. Instead, there was a literal roar of excitement and anger, and every voice that shouted in response was running at full speed toward the point from which the alarm had issued. A frightened oath from Stroud asserted his alarm. When they reached the tree where the two horses were tethered, he flung himself into the saddle upon the pinto and plunged away at full speed. Quirt and heels drummed or lashed the flanks of the poor pinto until the durable little cowpony was throwing its head high in fear and bewilderment. Jack Bristol, ranging alongside at the effortless gallop of Brown Susan, saw that his companion was wearing out his horse without even getting the full speed for a short distance out of the animal. "'Hold him in!' he cautioned Stroud. "'Let him hit his own gait. You're running him into the ground, partner.' Another oath answered him. "'Hold him in? Why, you fool, they'll have a dozen racers on our heels in a minute. They'll run us ragged inside of two miles.' He added, "'Listen, there they start. Good God, they must have been waiting for us all the time.' As he spoke, there was a fresh outburst of shouts behind them, and then a shrill and wailing cry. "'That's Lee Jarvis, damn him,' groaned Frank Stroud. "'That's Lee Jarvis on his hunter.' "'What? He's got a thoroughbred. Goes like the wind. We're done for. Jarvis and the rest must have been waiting for this to happen.' Even while he complained in his terror, he beat at the pinto, wrenching at the poor beast's mouth because it was incapable of a greater burst of speed, and every wrench, of course, helped to stop the cowpony. They were flying down the Culver River Road now, and close behind them a gun barked. Someone had fired at his shadow. That shot proved how close the danger stepped on their heels, however, and Frank Stroud fell into another fury of quirting. Finally, in disgust, Jack reined close. "'Look here,' he said. "'You see this mare I'm riding?' "'I see it. She's lightning on wheels. Lord, Lord, what a stride!' "'She'll beat the best they have behind her,' said Jack. "'She'll beat any of em if you'll ride her straight ahead and not start feeding her the whip. Go gentle with her, and she'll break her heart for you.' "'For me?' "'I mean it, Stroud. I gave a promise that I'd get you out of this, and I'm going to do it.' "'Man alive!' began Frank Stroud. "'We'll change horses. Mind, you make it a quick change. Then you ride straight down the road. When you get into my saddle, you'll find a rifle in the case. Don't use that gun shooting at men. You promise me that?' "'I do. One other thing, Stroud. When you get through with that hoss tonight, ride her up through the mountains after you've shook off the vigilantes, and leave her up at Hank Sherry's cabin.' Then you can strike a way through the mountains, and, going north, you'll make better time on foot than they could make if they lit out after you on hosses. Is that all clear? All clear, partner. If you don't leave that mare the way I say, why, Stroud, I'll find you in the end and tear your heart out. Partner, if I don't do what you tell me to do, I'm the worst hound that ever lived. But if you take this damned pinto, what's going to become of you? I'm going to play a game, that's all. I'm going to take a chance and win out. Don't you start worrying about me, son. Here we are. Now change. They drew rein in unison, and like practiced horsemen, bounded to the road and up again into the opposite saddles. Before them was a dark lane, where the trees from either side wound their branches together above the way and made a solid canopy. "'Ride like hell,' said Jack. "'Just let the reins hang. She'll take care of the rest. She can jump any fence you come to. She's as sure-footed as a goat. And forget that you got a whip.' This last advice was called after Frank Stroud, for the mare, once given her head, darted away to a lead of a dozen lengths in hardly as many seconds. She was fading away into the shadows almost at once. 
at the same time the leaders of the vigilantes entering the tunnel under the trees set up a tumult of shouts and halloos as they heard the pounding of the hoofs of their quarry so short a distance ahead jack bristol saw at once that the pinto could not live for ten minutes ahead of this pace and he ducked the cow-pony to the side and brought him up short behind a tree-trunk it made by no means a complete screen to an entire horse and rider he could only hope that the posse plunging headlong after the heels of brown susan would never think of glancing to the side it was on this hope that he had dared to make the exchange of horses with frank stroud brown susan with no great effort should be able to shake off the best horses of the vigilantes so there was no harm in letting the bulk of the pursuit thunder on after her so he waited pressing the pinto closer to the broad trunk of the tree and leaning in the saddle so that he could look around it and survey the hollow way the posse passed him in a rush of thundering hoofs one flying horse bounding in the lead that must be lee jarvis on his hunter and then half a dozen riders on mounts which were only a whit less fast that was the first flight of the pursuit behind came others and still more followed forty armed horsemen were rushing on the heels of brown susan and at the sight jack bristol's heart leaped with envy if he were only on the back of the matchless mare he would make a mock of these fellows and their pride he would play with them no doubt the thoroughbred could walk around susan on a straightaway but over rough ground and through the wear and tear of half a dozen miles of hunting the indomitable strength and courage would begin to tell but the pinto against such speed he had not a chance the last of the hunt rushed past and then as he reined the pinto back the cow-pony stumbled snorted recovered his feet that slight noise was a tragedy it had caught the ear of the last of the riders and now the fellow with a shout to his companions in the lead swerved his horse around and came rushing back so much jack waited to see and he saw also that other distant horsemen were swinging their mounts around there were ample numbers for two hunts this day as for jack he sent the pinto bolting through the woods which stretched before him there at least his training enabled him to put the fast roadsters of the others to shame accustomed to dodging hither and thither through the round-up at the heels of an agile calf the pinto darted through the forest like a football halfback down a broken field a tumult of curses and shouts to the rear announced that the section of vigilantes which had taken up this newer and hotter trail was driving ahead along it in spite of obstacles then the pinto came out onto a broad and smooth meadow but jack bristol cursed both the extent and the smoothness these were just the things the well-mounted men behind him wanted he cut along the edge of the woods for a short distance and then twitched the pinto about and put him into the woods again would they hear him yes he had fallen into a stretch of underbrush which set up a huge crackling and when the vigilantes came out into the open where their ears were not crammed by the racket which their own horses set up they caught the noise at once and came after him with a cheer but they lost ground on that manoeuvre they lost still more heavily in the second passage of the woods but when jack came on to the main river road once more he knew there could be no more dodging back and forth among the trees they would leave a guard on the outside and the inside of the grove after this and he would be running his head into a trap if he attempted to weave back and forth so he rattled off down the road at a round pace never putting the pinto to his full speed but keeping just inside it at a gait which the honest little horse could maintain for a great length of time would it be fast enough to hold off the flying vigilantes now that their own mounts had lost the keenest edge of their speed during the first brush he turned as soon as he was clear of the trees into the first rough field he struck ploughed ground and gave it his blessing 
here the pinto was at home and the thoroughbreds and half-breds which the posse bestrode could break their proud hearts fretting through the heavy going the pinto took it as a matter of course laboring cheerfully ahead with pricking ears for which jack's heart went out to him then looking behind he saw the vanguard of the enemy take the fence with a rush lee jarvis had taught his companions the pleasures of jumping and now they rode as to a hunt they had spied their quarry actually jogging at a trot in the semi-distance of the moonlight and they went for him with wild yells of pleasure hunting yes and the fox hunt was nothing compared to the man trail jack looked back anxiously he had not covered any great distance on that ploughed ground would it be an efficient barrier against the pursuit even for a little time he saw the leaders strike the soft dirt it made them flounder it stopped them up almost as though they had struck a stone wall a trot as men know is the thing for soft ground a walk of course is even better but who could keep a horse back to a trot when a quarry was actually in sight not these youthful vigilantes now that they could see their man they sent their horses ahead at a round gallop though at what prodigious cost of strength and wind to their mounts who could say they gained rapidly to be sure they gained so far on the trotting pinto that their leaders opened fire with revolvers but it was impossible to fire with any accuracy from the backs of horses pitching along through ploughed ground and the pinto went scatheless beyond he passed through an open gate and on to firm ground and now he loosed the rein and let the pinto fly away at full speed every instant placed yards of precious ground between him and the posse and they seeing what had happened with furious shouts spurred their mounts over the intervening stretch of the ploughed ground they reached the compacted soil quickly enough but they reached it with winded exhausted horses the first sprint out of dexter down the road had been enough to set their lungs laboring the labor through the trees had been an added burden and now this crossing the ploughed ground had exhausted most of them it was like trying to sprint uphill they galloped across the level and easy ground beyond but the spring was gone from their striding they gained slowly for the first mile then as the pinto struck into the first of the rolling hills the bigger horses behind him began to stop the fact that they were entirely spent was proved by the beginning of heavy fire from the vigilantes and now the pinto began to gain rapidly putting the yards behind him hand over hand safety was only the matter of another mile at the most before the beaten posse gave up the trail or else merely jogged on entirely disheartened the older heads among the posse seemed to realize this for now half a dozen of them stopped their horses altogether dropped to the ground and uncasing their rifles began to drop bullets around the fugitive revolver fire from the back of the running horse was one thing rifle fire from a rest was quite another jack bristol began to weave the galloping little pinto back and forth back and forth like a dancer and then in mid-stride the poor pinto was struck to the earth with a bullet through his head jack bristol was flung head over heels he rose with his head spinning it seemed to his dazed brain that enemies were rushing upon him from every corner of the compass then he ran for a circle of rocks which crowned the nearest hill eighteen my name said the brown-faced stranger is charlie ganton i been riding this way to find a gent named jack bristol riding on a brown mare that's called susan the slickest thing in the line of hoss flesh i ever seen i ain't seen him pass this way said hank sherry after a moment of due thought come in and rest yourself while i fix you up a snack for breakfast nope i ain't seen your man bristol charlie ganton threw his reins and dropped to the ground he stretched himself and then gave his body a violent shake the sun was newly up the mountain chill and the mountain freshness was in the air 
i ate at sunrise he said and i ain't hungry but i'll trouble you for a cup of that coffee sure sounds good to me and he sniffed eagerly as the fragrance of the vapor blew out to him the coffee was duly poured for him if i might be asking said hank sherry in his most ingratiating voice and manner might you have come far on his trail this jack bristol that you've been talking about about a thousand miles said charlie ganton carelessly pass me some of that sugar will you a thousand miles breathed the mountaineer a thousand miles on one trail his eyes grew cold and bright that means murder i guess that sure must mean a murder the other looked at hank for the first time with a keen attention for a moment he said not a word but sipped his coffee thoughtfully so's not to put you off on the wrong foot he said casually i'll tell you that it ain't murder and if you ever seen him passing this way you tell him that harry ganton ain't dead that harry's brother has been looking for him and if he wants to go back to his home town everything will be hunky-dory including the hoss put in charlie he gets the hoss too because harry allows that jack pretty near raised that filly anyways it belongs to jack by right of bringing up he says though speaking personal i don't see how he figures it the smile of hank sherry was so wonderfully bland that for the moment his face lost half of its ugliness he gets a hoss and he gets let off for murder he repeated that ought to sound like good news to him yep if i was to meet up with him i'll sure tell him what i know look here said charlie if you got any queer ideas from what i've said to you you might as well get over them right now my brother is a sheriff and he's fixed me up with a start and what not to go up here as his deputy i don't mind telling the rest of the yarn there ain't any mystery harry got into an argument with jack and they went for their guns and harry was the one that dropped the boys gave jack a run for his money but he got away on susan meantime harry is getting well hand over fist and he figures that the only way he can make up to jack for the long trail he sent him on is to give him that brown mare though susan would bring a thousand dollars or even two thousand out of more'n one man in arizona two thousand for a hoss breathed the mountaineer well that's a considerable price you folks down that way must be made of money sit down son and tell me about your part of the country just a minute said charlie how come this to be here from the junk pile nearest the door he picked up a piece of leather twisted into a peculiar braid how'd you get that hank sherry took the thing and turned it in his hand don't exactly recollect he said calmly don't remember what that might have come from hm said charlie his eyes bright with suspicion anything about it that looks queer to you yep i don't think i ever before seen a braid exactly like that one maybe you didn't said charlie because the only man i ever knowed worked up a leather braid like that was the man i'm after now jack bristol well 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 murmured the mountaineer stroking his bushy beard while he wagged his head you don't say friend i do muttered charlie ganton and finishing his coffee at a draught he stood up from his chair and fixed a keenly suspicious eye upon sherry at length as though not able to see in what manner the other could profit by keeping the whereabouts of bristol a secret if he knew he turned towards the door again which way had i better be going he asked the mountaineer hank sherry pointed to the east away from culver valley hit out yonder he said and you'll come into some good cow country if your man come up from arizona way most like he'd be pretty apt to want to get into the cow country again huh most like nodded charlie ganton and swung into the saddle again so long he called and waved his hand but before his roan mustang had taken half a dozen steps charlie turned abruptly in the saddle and surprised a complacent smile of triumph upon the lips of sherry the latter banished the pleased expression at once but not soon enough young ganton his brown face now darkened with suspicion and anger wheeled his horse and came straight back stranger he said coldly you know something what's up me said sherry know something how come 
partner said charlie ganton soberly let me tell you this the gent that i'm on the trail of is a wild one he was always on the ragged edge of raising hell and doing something that he could never undo now he thinks that he's done a murder and he's apt to do another if he thinks he's cornered he's that tigerish kind that go to hell quick once they've started that's why i ask you to put me onto his trail if you know it sure said hank sherry i'll do it in a minute i sure would hate to see a gent cavorting around raising ned i'd sure hate to see that and in spite of himself his glance wandered toward the west where culver valley lay beyond the mountains and as he glanced in that direction it happened by rare chance that frank stroud came over the hill and showed against the horizon on brown susan but it was merely the exigencies of the chase and through following the easiest way out of culver valley that he had come toward hank sherry's house not through a desire to follow his word as pledged to jack bristol and when charlie ganton with a shout of pleasure galloped toward him he drew up brown susan and meditated flight for never in his life had he bestrode such an animal as the mare she had carried him faultlessly all the night and she had baffled the best speed and cleverest maneuvers of the hardest riders in culver valley and he could not find it in his heart to give her up to hank sherry to be kept for the man who had delivered him from jail as for the man who galloped toward him he came alone and it was stroud's boast that he feared no one man in the world so he drew rein and waited charlie ganton in the meantime slackened his pace when he saw that the horseman was not jack bristol he drew down to a trot and then to a walk while the roan pricked his ears at sight of susan and neighed an eager greeting they had known each other of old in the ganton pastures far south partner asked charlie where's jack bristol never heard of him said stroud truthfully never heard of him well then let me put it another way who'd you get this hoss from i raised her said stroud she was foaled right on my ranch hell man snorted ganton in disgust look at the way she and this roan hoss of mine are rubbing noses don't that show they ain't strangers i ask you again where'd you get this hoss i know her as well as i know my brother it's susan look here said stroud smoothly though he shifted his hand so as to bring it nearer to the revolver which lay in the saddle holster i've seen men that folks couldn't tell apart and if that's true of men it's still truer of hosses i got no doubt that you think the name of this hoss is susan but it ain't the name of this hoss is bell i raised her on my own ranch ganton drew back partner he said i sure hate to do this but i got to i've come all the way from arizona to find the man that's been riding this hoss here's my badge he showed a star pinned inside the flap of his coat and i got to arrest you stranger for appearin with property that looks to me like stolen property arrest me declared frank stroud and his laughter was loud though he kept his chin down and watched the other with a snarling earnestness son you ain't got a chance get out of the way i'm due on the other side of the mountain and look out damn you keep your hand clear from your gun in the name of the law said charlie ganton with no little dignity i arrest you for to hell with you and the law exclaimed stroud get out of my way or they went for their guns by mutual agreement it seemed the weapons leaped as though recoiling from springs into their hands frank stroud was a shade quicker on the draw his weapon exploded but charlie ganton still sat his saddle at the last instant he had both stooped and twisted sideways and the bullet missed that moving and smaller target his own bullet discharged a fraction of a second later struck squarely on the shoulder of frank stroud jerking him far around the shoulder bones were splintered by the ball clasping his left hand over the wound he toppled to the ground with a cry of pain while brown susan starting back in alarm pricked her short ears and sniffed curiously at him end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the cross brand by max brand this librivox recording is in the public domain 19. 
the rocks to which jack bristol had run crested a small knoll and from this commanding position the onrushing vigilantes recoiled and scattered into a circle shouting their joy at having run the quarry to the ground while they rushed for positions of strategic importance however jack was busy as a beaver erecting a system of fortifications the great stones which were heaped upon the crest he pried apart and rolled into a rough-shaped triangle in the centre of this he could lie with a fair degree of safety so he crouched behind the barrier as soon as it was raised and waited it was the end of course he might endure a siege here for a single day without food or water but on the second day he must succumb there was only one possible hope for escape and that was through a rush under cover of the night to secure a horse from his besiegers and then break away across the country but to steal out through the night in the face of such a circle of hungry-hearted man-hunters and with the young moon shedding light over the hills would be merely a form of suicide presently he heard a strong voice calling across the night from the top of an overlooking hill hello stroud hello cried jack of course it was natural for them to think that this was stroud i'm coming down will you give me a truce to come by come on then no tricks a man appeared looking gigantic in the faint moonlight and came upon the hilltop against the sky he came boldly down into the hollow and then climbed the farther slope to the edge of jack bristol's fortification stroud he said at once the jig's up sort of looks said jack that it is the other exclaimed who the devil is this it ain't stroud why not i know frank's voice you're the other one then by god it's charlie sherry how'd you recognize me we knew that one of the hosses we was following was your hoss but it never popped into our heads that you'd swap hosses with stroud what happened did he take it away from you and after you got him out of jail sort of looks that way huh said jack sherry what the devil possessed you to break into the jail and get stroud out was he ever a friend of yours i can't remember him that way what does all this lead up to it leads up to this sherry give yourself up and come along with me and we'll give you a fair and square trial and if there's a hanging at the end of it it'll be a legal hanging sherry does that sound good to you who gives you authority to offer me all of this they told me to say that to stroud it'll hold for you too i guess go back and find out so the other departed but jack bristol knew beforehand that there would be no answer the men of culver valley had too many things against charlie sherry they had been balked by him once when he slipped through their hands now for half a night he had played back and forth with them and only by sheer luck or a chance shot had they managed to come within striking distance of him and now that they had him cornered they would finish him then and there he was right the stranger did not return to renew the proposal in the name of the rest of the vigilantes and when a little over an hour later a volleying of hoofbeats was heard in the distance jack knew that the rest of the posse had returned from their vain chase of susan and had come back to join in the killing of charlie sherry they began to build little bonfires behind the hilltops now and then shadows brushed into his view it was long range for a revolver but had he wished to do murder he could have dropped more than one of the youngsters whose shouts and laughter rang down to him they were making a merry night of it while they waited for a chance to get their quarry once he thought that their noise-making might indicate a lax watch and he slipped outside of his little fortress prepared for a dash for liberty but the instant he began to run there was a solid volley of rifles and he leaped back into his shelter with bullets flocking thick around him after that it was not long before pink began to streak the east and with the coming of light the bombardment began just north of him rose the highest hill it looked down upon him at such a sharp angle that they could open a dangerous and close plunging fire they had followed his example and erected with their many hands an ample and strong barrier of rocks 
thrusting out the muzzles of their rifles through the interstices among the stones, they dropped slug after slug into the triangle of Jack's fort. Not a shot flew wild. It was a large target, and they had plenty of lead, so they amused themselves in fancy and freakish bits of marksmanship. They chipped the points off the rocks, they placed their bullets neatly through the holes of his wall, they proved to him in a hundred ways that he had only to show himself in order to be riddled with lead. He showed a small stick. It was only a streak of a thing to be shot at, yet it had not been exposed three seconds before the end was snipped off. He showed it again, and again it was severed, and the crowd on the higher hill yelled their satisfaction. He tossed a rock into the air, and with a cheer the youngsters above him loosed a volley. That rock struck the ground unnicked, but the next one he threw was snuffed to powder when a bullet struck it. They had scarred and whitened the surface of the rocks on the farther side of his wall, but still they kept it up. Each one of them had a cartridge belt to empty, and each was doing his best to get rid of powder and shot yet it was not an altogether useless exhibition, for it kept Jack crowded into a corner, not daring to move. The sunlight was beginning to slant and spill into his fort when he heard a sudden shouting of dismay and then warning cries. Peering out through a hole in the wall, he saw Nell Carney galloping at full speed across the hollow, while a score of voices were vainly warning her away. To Jack Bristol she came like a hope of heaven to one damned. When she drew near, he rose to meet her. Of course, there were expert riflemen looking on, but would they dare to draw a bead, no matter with what skill, when Nell Carney was so near the target at which they aimed? They did not dare. There was only an excited and enraged clamor of voices, and then Nell Carney had reined her horse beside him, and was commanding him, in a voice hysterical with fear, to get back into shelter. He did not stir. She dropped out of the saddle and stood beside him, so that her nearness could more effectually shield him. "'Oh, why, why have you done it?' she cried because I promised you to get him out, and he's free now, I guess. You held up the jail-keeper. You gave Frank your own horse. Was there ever such a generous madman in the world? Lady, not a crazy man, but a gent that did what he told you he'd do. It looks like I throwed myself away. But, you see, it was only the luck that broke against me. They nailed my hoss with a lucky shot. They nailed that poor old pinto hoss that I was riding, and that was sure an honest hoss if ever an honest hoss stopped. He worked like a trooper, never let up till he had all of them fast steppin' hosses dead beat. And you spend your time pitying the horse you rode when, when you're in a place like this? Nell! cried a voice from the top of the hill. Jack looked up and saw Lee Jarvis recklessly exposing himself and calling to the girl to go from the hilltop at once, for otherwise terrible things were apt to happen. Jack raised his hand, and the figure on the hilltop dropped out of view behind his barricade. "'Doesn't take sooth and syrup to quiet him,' said Jack, grinning at the girl. "'Leave you?' she answered the demand of Lee Jarvis. "'I'm going to stay until they promise to let you have law.' "'You're wrong,' said Jack. "'You've got less than a minute to stay.' She shook her head. "'It was I who brought you into this, and I'm going to stay until you're out of danger.' "'Oh, that's like you,' said Jack thoughtfully. "'A gent could see that you'd be as square as that. But it don't work, lady. I'm not going to hide behind a woman's skirts. That's ten times worse than dying. You see? But before you go, I'm going to ask you one thing.' "'You believe me when I say that I'm not Charlie Sherry?' "'I believe you,' she answered, with great tears glistening in her eyes. "'Oh, I knew all the time that you couldn't be he, but the scar seemed proof. I knew all the time, for there was something which made me believe what you said, and not what my eyes told me.' "'Then one more thing,' said Jack. "'Whatever happens to me, will you keep in your mind that Lee Jarvis ain't worthy of you?' Nell, I've heard him lie about a man that licked him in a fair fight, and a man that's lied about that ain't worth his salt. 
I'm only waiting to face him alone, and then I shall tell him, said the girl, grown stern and savage for a moment. And that's all, said Jack. Good-bye. I told you before, and I tell you now, I'm not going. Nell, in my part of the country, a gent that hides behind a woman is called the worst hound in the world. If you don't go, I'm going to walk down that hill right into their guns. I swear I am. I'll fight this out without a woman's help. No, no. I mean it. She threw out her hands toward him, then checked the appeal. I'll go back up the hill and make them swear to give you a legal trial. Will you surrender then? When they agree to a legal trial, yes, said Jack, and swallowed a sardonic smile. But the girl, with a cry of triumph, was into the saddle, and as he dropped back into shelter, she turned in the saddle and kissed her hand to him, in full view of those armed watchers on the hill. There was something so gay and so gallant about her that it stopped his heart, and, raising his head a little too recklessly, a bullet jammed the hat off his head and flicked away a lock of his hair. And after that the steady bombardment was resumed. There was no more heard of the girl. They had taken her by force and led her away, as he knew that they would. They had led her away, and new men pouring in every moment from the surrounding farms, fresh belts of ammunition were beginning to empty toward the little fort, as though they actually planned to shoot away the stones to powder. In the meantime, the pressure of a new and even more terrible enemy began to be felt. It was the rising sun, which, as it sloped up toward Meridian, heated the stones until they were difficult to touch while the direct rays scorched the motionless body of the fugitive. If he could have raised his head above the wall to meet the breeze, but then there were bullets waiting, and he must endure all the day long until night. What time was it now? Not more than ten at the most. He amused himself looking out through the holes among the rocks and watching the arrival of newcomers until, close to the intolerable heat of the noon hour, he saw a rider coming on a horse whose liquid gallop was vaguely familiar. Yes, all in an instant he knew that it was Susan. Had Frank Stroud come to give himself up in return for the freedom of the prisoner in the fort? No, in another moment his heart sank still more, for he had made out the bronzed features of Charlie Ganton, who would add to the list of charges against him that of murder. After this he could expect no mercy indeed. And suddenly he decided that he had endured long enough. It was useless to wait until his last energy was exhausted. Better, far better, to die while he still had the strength to die fighting. He loaded his revolver, saw that it was in good working trim, drew up his belt to the last notch, and prepared to rise to his knees. But as he did so, Charlie Ganton rode over the brow of the hill above. To lead a charge? No, he came with his hand raised, and behind him, man after man, was rising and waving. They were even calling what sounded like friendly words. He listened in a daze, and when Charlie rode up, he rose, hardly knowing what he did. He found his hand gripped in a strong grasp. He felt himself clapped on the back. "'By God, Jack!' Charlie was crying. "'I've come at a lucky hour. But the trouble's over. I've come to tell you that Harry is not dead. That bullet only sliced him across the breast, the lucky devil. He's not dead, and he sent me a thousand miles after you to get you out of mischief.' and he's throwing in Susan here for full measure to make up for the distance you've traveled. The brown mare thrust her head between them and poked her wet muzzle into the face of Jack. He patted her between the eyes, but still he was dazed, too utterly bewildered to understand. Other men were coming. Was it a trick, after all? No, they could not assume such smiling faces. They were not actors enough for that. I've cash to pay the man who owned the Pinto, and I've left Frank Stroud, the skunk, at Hank Sherry's, that old fox. They can get Stroud and bring him back to the Dexter jail whenever they want. 
if they want to go the limit and hold you for breaking into the jail i have a warrant here from harry to arrest you on another charge for something you done first but that warrant will never be served jack except to get you out of this mess and then the whole truth burst on him like a flood of light not out of the words which he had heard kindly charlie ganton speak but because he saw nell kearney come galloping over the hill while lee jarvis rode down-headed in the opposite direction he saw her sweep into the hollow like a bird he saw her spur at full speed up the slope again and before the others she was before him and stood on the ground facing him and laughing but all the while that she laughed the tears were coursing down her face oh jack bristol she cried i'm the happiest person in the world because you knew all the time that you were an honest man but i could only hope it nell he answered i never knew until this moment that i would die an honest man that was the speech which charlie ganton carried back to the southland but it was a speech which the townsmen in arizona could not quite believe they were still waiting to see the name of jack bristol in a headline for that matter so is mrs jack bristol but she expects to see her husband's name in print for far other reasons for culver valley has decided that it needs a sheriff the vigilantes are a matter of the past so completely broken is their power that jack bristol could bring old hank sherry back into the valley with all of his crimes and all of his sorrows upon his head and there he lives by the verge of the river in a hut whose front door looks out toward the blue culver mountains end of chapter nineteen end of the cross brand by max brand